Welcome back to this continued series on best practices. We're going to be looking at a demo of a Unity game and how it exemplifies those best practices. In this video, we'll recap some of the best practices quickly. If you want to learn more, I recommend checking out the rest of the series. Then we'll look at a case study of exactly how one game is structured and how it answers some of the best practices. And then we'll do a demo inside Unity before we end up the video. Now, best practices in software include principles, patterns, architectures, and more. Check out the link above for a video specifically on the best practices in software. And for the best practices inside the Unity editor, we're going to be taking a look in this video about how they're applied. But to learn more about the theory and some other resources you can find, you wanna check out the link above to learn more about project setup, structure, coding standards, some of the popular and packages and workflows. There's lots of great resources you can find to see best practices employed in Unity projects that you can take a look at. What I'm gonna show is one of the sample games that I have built on top of my custom mini MVCS architecture. If you're interested to learn more about the specifics of MVCS, which is Model, View, Controller, and Service, I've got a great premium course available on demand, and it covers these topics here, overviewing some of the best practices that we've seen in this series, but applied specifically to Unity with MVCS architecture. It also talks about what is MVC, why you'd wanna use it, what are the benefits in your game, and then lots of different examples with video and downloadable sample projects so you can get your hands dirty with it. As part of that course, there's a free source repo that you can get. And we're gonna be taking a look at one of the samples that's inside the advanced series of samples in there. So the link to that is below. And if you wanna follow along or take a look at what I've shown here, you can open that up in Unity and play with it for free anytime you want. So we're gonna look at this one sample and let's start with what the player experience is. So here's a screenshot from four of the different scenes inside this sample game project. Now this is meant for sample and for learning, so the code is especially well commented and the scope of the project is kept quite simple. Also, there's temporary programmer art here, so we can appreciate the blocky style of the art that's there. So we'll step through the scope and the functionality that's in each of these and just talk through them. I'm not gonna be showing too much code in this walkthrough, but download and take a look at the source code and you can follow along. So the player customized here, this first image, is the intro menu. Then the set character colors is about customization of a character which we see in many popular games today, and it could be quite complex. So having it be in a dedicated scene with some dedicated class and functionality is nice. Then I also thought, well, what about customizing the environment, the look and the feel of the world that you're in, perhaps the game rules that could be applied to different types of levels, and how would you be able to easily and scalably drop those rules in and out of gameplay depending on the user's menu options here? And then finally, there's the game scene which here is simply moving around in the world. There's not much of a game to it, but it does take arrow key or gamepad movement and allows you to move into the world. So let's take a look at this. Now, while the sample is very simple, I'm gonna be comparing it to some popular games and how the scope of each area of this game could be much, much more complex if you were to shift into production with it, for example. So here in the intro menu, we've got just three options and they link to the other three scenes that we see here, but you can imagine main menu screens can get really complex. Let's take a look at this example from the latest season of Fortnite. Now here we can see not only a lot more UI, but there's subsections to this menu that gets deep into all the different sorts of things you can do. Taking a look at the play menu, locker, shop, the pass, quests, competition, seeing your character stats. There's also the monetization side, there's so much more, and this is a season-based game, so periodically over the course of a calendar year, you swap out the look and the feel and the characters and have all sorts of content. So you can see just the intro menu of a production game these days is really, really complex. Now you can imagine setting up your project with best practices in mind from the beginning and with an architecture such as the MVC one that I recommend, it helps you within just this scene to organize this massive amounts of complexity, as well as communicate between those scenes. Moving on to the second scene here, imagine you wanna customize your character. 
So being able to set the different colors of your character is the simplicity in the demo here. I also have it right to disc so that when you stop and start the game session, it remembers the outfit that you chose just as a demonstration of being able to read and write uh, to your local machine or to a backend server. So that's included, but the you know simple example here just allows you to change the colors of the head, the chest and the legs of the character. But back into our example here, using something like Fortnite, imagine all the different complexity of being able to put on different weapons, try different skins, being able to monetize, sell, offer those skins, perhaps trade, especially if you connect your game with social features, allowing players to see each other, share items across each other, and then the added complexity, imagine if some or all of those items actually impact gameplay. I mean, we're really talking about character customization, which feels like such a small subsystem, but it could be really, really big. And again, managing that complexity takes some time and some care. Here we see just some of the things that are subsystems within your game, including things like being able to customize your character and also offer user-generated content. So within the customization of the character, things like the emotes, sprays, different skins, as I mentioned, having voice dialogue that changes with each character choice, also having user-generated content, allowing your users to contribute into that character customization or the levels that happen in the world or the crafting systems. All of this can really blow out what feels like a potentially small feature now becomes quite big and overwhelming unless you've got these best practices in place. And if your current game doesn't need all of these features, then definitely you don't have to add that scope in. But again, following these best practices and learning them as you go, your smaller projects will be better designed and you're ramping up your ability to scale as a team or as an individual and contribute to these large scale projects as we see here. Moving on to the set the environment color scene, you could think of this as being able to set custom game rules or being able to customize the world or being able to have custom level design if the game needs um, to offer that kind of thing. So in just the preferences and settings of Fortnite as an example, we've got all sorts of different things. That top menu that we see there has everything from ways to have input, game controllers, audio, all different sorts of stuff, being able to customize the look and the feel of the menus. And here's just the configuration for some of the settings. We've got the different key mappings and things like that. So again, blowing out the settings area of your game or adding game rules in here. Do you have one minute rounds or three minute rounds? Being able to structure that in a way so that you're able to set them here, but then when you get to the game scene, it properly reads the configuration and knows how to construct or build the current user specific world. This again can be really complex if you don't have all these parts in place. And finally, there's the game scene itself. Now, it's taken us a while to just get to this part. Some of us, when we sit down to design a project, particularly a, a game jam or an indie game, we often think of just the core game loop, which is even a subsection of just this scene. We might not think about the complexity that comes with those other systems. We, we begin with the game scene coding. Perhaps that's where we prototype, we make sure that this game is fun, that the input works well, and that this is worth investing more time and energy too. So it might be the game that we start with here as one of these scenes, but then we actually bring in to add in those other scenes to complement. Then of course, as the expectations of the users are higher and higher, we would then probably add to the menu, add to the character customization later in the game. And having all that play nicely so that no matter which order you decide to develop these features in, you end up with a project that you're happy to live within, it can be a challenge. So having decided architectures using good principles from the beginning can really help you. So here's a quick screenshot showing Fortnite in the action. Now, here we've got lots of different subsystems. You can imagine the mini map and the world orientation and the inventory. Those things might also be reflected in other views, sub menus we could open up here or some of those other scenes that we saw already. So being able to have that data live in one spot, but be able to be reflected to the user and properly get only 
or set and get as values in different areas of your game becomes really important. Now, I've been working with an MVC framework for years and years, and often within the game space, there's an argument to be made that, hey, maybe the MVC isn't the best pattern for all aspects of our game. So maybe in the menus it makes sense, but in the core game it might not. And that's a fair point. Maybe just here, where that character is moving around, interacting and animating, needs to happen with some other solution that is not specifically MVC. You might wanna have that be so designed for, let's say, runtime optimization and efficiency that you choose to use some other architecture or structure for that, and that's perfectly fine. Solutions like MVC can be used in some of your project or all of your project, depending how you want. It's flexible to mix and match however you like. But one of the things that I'm reflecting on here, looking at those different scenes, we see how much development effort is required before we actually get to moving the character around in the world and interacting with the environment. When we first conceive of a game, it seems like this character flying through the air, picking up a gun, shooting around and interacting with the environment is like all the effort we need. But there's tons of other subsystems, particularly in a modern game. So being able to pick and choose which areas of those have your architecture employed or choosing the best architecture for different areas is nice and being able to mix and match them is cool too. And lastly, in the sample, I've got a developer console scene. So a fifth scene here. And I think that's a really nice luxury to have as developers so that instead of having several different kind of cheat menus or having special hotkeys that help give you infinite health, so that as a developer, you're able to play your own game more easily or skip certain levels. Having at least one dedicated scene that maybe that gear icon shown in the corner from any scene brings you here, pauses the action and allows you to tweak values. Now, the only thing I offer in our simple game here is just resetting the colors back to the default colors as an example of undoing changes you've done along the way. But you can imagine having different things here like uh, being able to blank out and create a new player so that you can retest what that's like from within the game experience, giving that first time user experience a test. You could also have an option here to skip through levels to reward your character more gold or more experience so that the moment you depart this developer console, you can jump into that point of the action and continue your testing experience there. So it's really helpful to have this in there. Something that I build into all of my prototypes I would say if I'm doing a game that I anticipate would be one month or more, which is basically every production project that I do, then what we're talking about here are all the best practices that I bring into that. And by having this done from the beginning, you'll be amazed at how often you'll think, oh, I wanna do this, I'm gonna A, B, test a potential feature to decide which of two paths I wanna go, and this is one great spot you've already got set up to cleanly put this in there. Then once it's done, it's really easy to lock it down so that end users don't have access to the scene, for example, so that it's easier than having, let's say, cheat codes throughout your entire code base that is hard to keep track of. Now, a developer console like this is not really meant for the end published game experience, but you could certainly do that. We've seen published AAA games before that allow you to interact with some or all of the developer console features, enabling things like a god mode. So perhaps if you want, as an optional side item, you could think about offering some of this debug functionality to your end users. But when I generally position this inside my own game teams, I don't think about this aspect. But I just wanted to mention it because I think it's really cool when games do offer that. So there we saw the end user experience, but what's the developer experience like working within a project like this? So here's some of the best practices again. We've seen this list before. I would say, at first, deciding which of these best practices make sense for you and your team. You might have different goals for shorter projects or longer projects, uh, and finding the right blend of solutions that make sense to your specific goals and your specific needs would make sense on each project. That said, there is a natural tendency to imagine, hey, on this project, we're not gonna run into any problems, so why bother? So it's good to have some disciplined members of your team who have that experience that know that most any project is going to have the same challenges coming up and be disciplined enough to add them on day one. So it does take some vision, some forethought, and you know, putting in the, the hard work there. 
So each one of these that you choose to adopt, be cautious that you know that there comes a cost if we choose to adopt, let's say, a very purposeful amount of automated testing, and then you set goals around that, that will contribute some of the time and energy that you need to spend across your, your game's uh, roadmap. So you have to make choices and make sure that you have the resources to allocate. That said, as a developer who works on a team that has these standards, your quality of life will begin, let's say, a bit more tricky because you have to think about these things when you're laying them out. And then as you add that fifth, 10th, 100th feature, you're going to see those benefits really ripple back. It's said that while we think that 100% of our life as a programmer or developer is about adding new features, it's only about 20% of our time is spent adding new features. 80% is spent managing existing features, including handling bugs. So this, while it feels like it's quite time consuming, it's really part of that 20%, and then you get the benefits across that 80% where you're maintaining those existing systems. So having that perspective can help with buy-in in your team to adopt the resources that you need to be able to implement this. So the project structure, as we've seen it here, is following those best practices that I've talked about throughout the series. Inside the Unity project window, you have the Unity assets folder, if you're not too familiar. And then inside of that, having different folders for all the different assets that could potentially be in your game. Now, in this specific one that we've looked at, I have things broken out within the scripts into runtime for mini MVCS area, and then what I called standard here. I don't really have a good name for it, but things that are not quite part of that framework. So you might find in your game that, let's say, when you're animating the character itself or doing your core game loop, maybe as a team you decide that should not be part of the MVC because for, let's say, RAM optimization or CPU cycle optimization, you wanna have things run in a much tighter loop instead of stepping through the architecture itself. So you may choose to do that. So just having that distinction, what is in the mini, which is the MVC framework, and what is in the standard. Now expanding that out, we can see we've got concepts of the controller, the model, the view, the service. In my custom framework, I also have something called a feature, which is a group of the other concerns. So if you wanna turn on a game feature, let's say that top HUD that we see, you can add one feature and that adds the model view controller, et cetera, specific for it. So it's kind of a, a macro or a composite. But the general MVC principles of model view controller and service would all be articulated as folders as we see there. Now here's two mutually exclusive ways that I could have organized this. So on the left is the solution that's committed to the repo. Here I've got the model view controller, each as separate folders, and feature exists just as a single class. Or you could actually, under the features folder, have your features each in a specific folder. So maybe your customized character has its controller feature in view, and then the customized environment has its few classes. I actually like that organization by feature more, but it's something new for me to play around with, and it's not as conventional as breaking up the model view controller service as we see, so that's why I've chosen to do the option on the left, at least for now. If you're interested to see those best practices and architecture that we've discussed and go deeper into it, you can take a look at this course that's available now and it's linked below. That's it for this video on case study. We did a quick intro and a recap on some of the best practices. Again, you can take a look at the rest of the series to really get deep into that. And then we did the case study here, looking at that one sample project and talking a bit about the growing complexity that you can have in each of those scene areas of the gameplay. Then we're closing up here. I wanna say thanks for your time, checking out this case study with the sample project for Unity Mini MVCS.